Is that okay? Thank you. That's yeah. fine. Good. Okay. So, so first of all, I'd like to thank uh, AOS for this kind invitation uh, to uh, partake in this uh, great symposium uh, with all these uh, great speakers. Uh, and we're really talking about an important topic, I think, really, which is looking at the effect of uh, bacteria and bacterial resistance. And my talk is going to really focus on the uh, promise of high concentration levofoxacin and the previous speakers has sort of alluded to some of the issues that we're all facing when we're dealing with these problems uh, clinically. These are my financial disclosures uh, pertaining to this talk. So we know antibiotics can divide it up into two broad types. One is bactericidal and one is basically one is bacterial static. And you can see them both here on the left hand side and how they basically uh, prevent the, the bacteria or the organism from replicating depends on basically their mechanism of action. And this is either related to this function on the cell wall, or it can be related to the protein function, such as on the ribosomes, or it can basically be function uh, related to uh, DNA replication. We know that uh, fluoroquinolones uh, particularly basically affect on DNA gyrase and toporosimerase uh, type four, and they inhibit basically DNA uh, replication. So there is then subsequently no protein for, uh, formation and there's no subsequent bacterial uh, replication uh, downstream of this tar. And over the years, we've seen an in evolution of uh, fluoroquinolones uh, from the first generation all the way to what we consider to basically be the fourth generation. And you've heard some excellent talks about drug resistance uh, profiling. And this has really occurred between the second and basically what we consider to be the third generation. And there's several ways in which resistance um, has occurred, as Professor Sharma uh, talked about. And this can be related to alterations or mutations in the DNA gyrase, and you can have an effect on the um, on the outer membrane um, of the cell, so it can affect the permeability itself. And this can affect the efflux mechanism of how affected these antibiotics are. And these are some of the mechanisms in which resistance can basically form. If you look at uh, levofloxacin in particular, and you compare it against the other generation of um, fluoroquinolones, and you're basically measuring the concentration in the aqueous, you can see levofloxacin offers one of the highest uh, concentrations within the anterior chamber, showing you the efficacy of its penetration. Uh, this is also basically shown over here, comparing to Ophrox and Ciproxin, measured in the cornea and also basically in the aqueous, where you can see the concentration and levels are between 1.7 and 2.7 fold greater penetration. And this is, of course, important if you're doing, uh, dealing with corneal diseases, as we've heard from Rajesh talking about bacterial keratitis, but likewise also if you're dealing with anterior chamber inflammation or very severe diseases that have already penetrated into, into the anterior chamber, where you want to basically get good aqueous concentration as well. Uh, the uh, drug itself is basically sensitive over a whole range of distant diseases. So pretty much all the ocular surface and adenexal um, um, inflammatory or bacterial basically diseases. And over several studies, they've shown it to be quite a good um, efficacy rate um, over uh, when you, several studies have been done over different time periods. When you look at the different strains, of course, you've had previous speakers talking about different, the importance of knowing the strains that you're basically dealing with. Post-market surveillance using uh, levofloxacin has shown good, basically, efficacy rates to staph, strep, and also basically enterococcus, and also basically with other gram-negative um, organisms. But you'll see some of the gram-negative organisms, such as Pseudomonas, for example, are lower than what we're able to achieve with the gram-positive organisms as well. Um, adverse effects, of course, are important to understand. They're generally quite low with these antibiotics because this is primarily a preservative-free uh, formulation. And if you look at the the um, uh, issues with um, uh, drug uh, side effects, they're mainly dependent either to uh, gastrointestinal disorders from systemic absorption, so this can be reduced by punctal occlusion, or basically related to local eyelid disorders, uh, typically um, eyelid uh, itching or basically blepharitis. One of the other issues that's important to consider, especially as ocular surface or anterior segment surgeons, if we do penetrating gariplasty, is the effect on epithelial growth. And you can see from over here that you can see when you're looking at the viability of your epithelial cells, when you're comparing basically levofoxacin over here on the right-hand side, this is 0.5 levofoxacin compared to control group, compared to Cipro, uh, levofoxacin offers one of the highest levels or uh, with respect to viability of human corneal epithelial cells. And this is important when we're considering um, epithelial regrowth, say after penetrating keratoplasty or after dog, when the new epithelium of the recipient cornea is growing on the graft tissue. This is shown in another comparison over here where you're comparing levofloxacin compared to moxifloxacin, uh, typically postoperatively. Cell viability over here is in the y-axis and you can see this from 30 minutes over to 24 hours compared to basically the control group. And this is showing you in a tabulated form. And you can see the viability of human corneal epithelial cells after 24 hour exposure to antibiotics is 
uh, with levofloxacin, but only 5% with basically moxifloxacin. And again, like I said, if you have a patient undergoing surface ablation uh, therapy, where obviously the epithelium has been denuded and you want the epithelium to grow back quickly because you're going to reduce the rate of infection, then of course you want something that's going to aid your cellular migration as opposed to inhibit this uh, inhibit it itself. And likewise, when you're doing migration assays, comparing to Krug control group on top, uh, levofloxacin in the middle and moxifloxacin at the bottom, you'll see the differences with, it, with respect to percentage wound healing compared to levofloxacin compared to moxifloxacin. Um, this is significantly different at 94% compared to almost 60% as well. Now, antibiotic um, development, as Professor Sharma basically showed from initially from the penicillins and up, up into the to the early development up, in, up into the 70s has really undergone a void over the last sort of 20 to 30 years. And people have been looking at other ways or repurposing um, other drugs, um, particularly they've been used systemically that may also basically be used for basically antibiotic therapy. Or one of the other things they've been looking at is looking at your natural defenses on the ocular surface with respect to developing a drug. And the reason why this has been a huge issue is actually, to be frank, drug development is very, very expensive. And we know the fact that the resistance patterns can occur quite early once a basically drug uh, has basically been uh, come onto the market. And, and, that, and because of those two things, a lot of companies are, are unwilling or they're hesitant to invest a lot of money in developing new forms of antibiotics. But from a clinical side, you can see from this diagram over here, when you're looking at percentage resistance patterns, and if you look at India over here in the red line over here, you'll see practically from a clinical standpoint, we're all dealing with high levels of resistance or, or, or bacterial resistance when we're seeing patients in the clinic. So we're stuck in this dilemma where the, the industries, uh, are, they, they may be reluctant to actually develop new antibiotics because of the cost issue and bringing it to basically market. But from a clinical standpoint, we are basically having to face more and more patients who are basically getting more resistance to the current antibiotic therapy that we're basically looking at. Now, one of the things that uh, two of some of the previous speakers have basically talked about has been the effect of this concentration. This is the PKPD theory with respect to how uh, levofloxacin 1.5% was basically developed itself. And as the previous speakers have mentioned, there are a couple of things to basically look, like, look at. One is the mean inhibitory concentration. And ideally, what you're trying to aim for is 10 times above this level where you can basically kill all the organisms that are basically known to basically be present um, in the sample itself. And Professor Sharma nicely showed that on a Petri dish where you can see the MBC showed there was no evidence of any culture at that level itself. So you can dose an antibiotic up to this level to basically ensure that they don't get resistance. But one of the issues when you do a high dose antibiotic is one, of course, is compliance. But the second is, is that can you actually get that concentration of antibiotic at that level in the specific tissue target? This is basically showing this a little more elegantly in a, in a curve over here itself. And what I'm talking about is your Cmax. So this is your target concentration in the tissue of basically interest. This TAM or time above the MIC shows you the time at which you're at that, above that concentration uh, with respect to the target tissue as well. And the administration dose is your Tmax, so it's the time it takes to actually achieve this level itself. And what we're trying to do is achieve such a high level of concentration in the target tissue that you're basically preventing any basically mutant strains being uh, formed. This is also shown in this diagram over here where you can see that there is a window period, as Professor Sharma showed, where you get what we call the mutant selection, basically window period over here. And if I show you this cartoon at the top over here, where you have a typical population of bacterial cells itself, and if you take the bottom curve at the bottom over here, you will see that this bacterial population over here is basically growing quite well because the antibiotic that's basically been used in this example over here is below the MIC. So this is typically below the MIC. When you go into the mutant selection window period, so you're above the MIC uh, window itself, but you're below the uh, MPC, which is basically the area in which you're going to basically get a pathogen resistance or mutation resistance itself, you will see that your antibody is killing the sensitive bacteria. So this is in B over here, but the resistance organism is still going to basically be there, okay, because you're below this basically threshold. But if it's possible to go above this threshold, as I showed you on the previous curve over here, you can basically clear everything. And this is ideally basically what you want to achieve. So you need to have an antibiotic that has high penetration with respect to the tissue or target of interest, and ideally a broad spectrum of activity, so it will have this effect on multiple different organisms. So the question is, is that this is the theory behind this, is this basically what is achievable on a practical circumstance? 
So if we look at basically the concentration uh, profile of the uh, um, uh, levofloxacin 1.5%, and we're looking three target tissues, one is the cornea, one is the aqueous humor, one is the anti antiobitrous, and you see the levofloxacin over here is in blue, gatifloxacin is in green, moxifloxacin is in a gray, and bezofloxacin is basically in blue. You will see from all these diagrams over here that levofloxacin has the highest concentration in the cornea, it has the highest concentration in the aqueous humor, and it has the highest concentration within the anti -eritreous. So sure enough, after the time of installation, you do achieve the highest concentration in with respect to the target tissue of interest that you basically want the fluoroquinolone to uh, react. If you look at the uh, concentration profiles and you basically compare single installation versus repeat installation, so this is basically one dosing compared to multiple dosing, you will see the effect on the concentration gradient. So of course, with multiple dosing, you get an increase of 2.5 concentrations, so you get a much higher concentration of drug at the target site. And often that's why when we start off with some antibiotic therapy, often I'll ask the patients to increase the frequency of dosing with respect to the first few hours, so you can get a buildup of the concentration of basically the drug. So this is the repetitive insulation basically bar over here, and this is higher in the levofloxacin 1.5 group compared to GATI, MOXI, and bezoblacifloxacin on this side over, over here as well. And this is cornea on the left and aqueous humor on the right-hand side. So what about in other basically tissues of the adnexi? So in the cornea, I basically uh, showed you as well, this is comparing levofloxacin 1.7, to compared to um, um, levofloxacin 0.9% and 0.5%. So in the cornea, I've already shown you compared to other fluoroquinolones, but you'll see the same effect in other tissue of the anterior segment. So in the bulbar conjunctiva, in the palpable conjunctiva, and likewise, as I've shown you also in the aqueous humor. So what you're getting in the cornea and also basically in the anterior chamber is also replicated in other dosing on the ocular surface as well with respect to the C-max in tissue. And this study was basically done on rabbit eyes, which are, which are very similar um, to humanize with respect to their size of the anterior segment. If you look at basically the organisms um, and with respect to microbial activity, you'll see there is a wide range of microbial activity spectrum, both for uh, gram positive, gram negative, and also basic anaerobics compared to other available um, fluoroquine loads on the market as well. And this has been also shown in several studies when you're looking at the range of the MIC concentrations, whether you look at MIC 50 or you go all the way up to MIC 90, you'll see low levels of MIC levels when you're looking at the gram positive cocci, and likewise, basically, when you're looking at the gram-negative uh, bacilli as well. And this has been shown in several, uh, by several groups um, with several studies looking at various um, uh, organisms as well. Now, from a clinical standpoint, when you start a patient on the medication itself, obviously, we want to know what is the response to action. And the study looking at 176 cases you, using uh, levofloxacin 1.5%, you will see overall um, from initiation of treatment, about 67 to so two thirds of patients had a reduction in their symptoms basically by three days. And this was reduced to 96% by, by one week itself. Likewise, if you actually tested the ocular surface, so this is showing you the antiseptic or the antimicrobial effect on the surface tissue of interest, you will see that by three days, 95.5% of the bugs in the ocular surface were basically eliminated. So that you're getting a very high level of killing or, or a therapeutic effects from the C-max. So it shows you what I showed you with the C-max earlier is not a something in theory or what's been shown in animal studies. It's also basically shown in clinical cases where you're getting a high level of basically C-max with respect to what you're able to culture from the ocular surface. And this is by three days, you're getting 95.5% response. And this goes up to 99.4 response basically by one week as well. Uh, one of the issues that you might think about, well, if you're using a higher concentration drug, is that are you going to basically get more side effects? And in, in this study, when you're looking at basically side effects from the drug, there were only 2.9% out of a total of 238 cases. The three of these were basically related to eye irritation, one from basically a bad uh, taste. So again, as I said, this could be eliminated with punctual occlusion, one from urticaria, and one basically from itching as well, which is a pretty low number in the large series that basically it would look like. So even though you're using a higher concentration drug, it doesn't mean, seem to mean that you're getting a lot of uh, adverse side effects locally on the surface of the eye. But one of the things that we worry about as corneal surgeons is that what is the effect on epithelial toxicity? Because again, if you're going to use this with respect to bacterial keratitis, if you have high concentration of the drug, it can actually delay wound healing. 
In this study that was done on monkey eyes, where you're comparing 3% levofloxacin compared to 1.5% levofloxacin over here in maroon, and this is basically the control group over here in gray, you'll see the 1.5% levofloxacin actually mirrors what you're actually getting in the control group over here itself with respect to the area of the epithelial defect. Once it's, once it's basically scratched from the ocular surface, it was almost completely healed basically by two days, over 90%, and three days, almost basically 100% healing uh, effect on the surface itself. So by using the higher concentration, you are not having any long-term or any basically effect with respect to epithelial toxicity. So it's not basically affecting epithelial migration. And previously I showed you the comparison when you basically compare this drug compared to other fluoroquinones that are available on the market as well. But one of the interesting points, and uh, you know, we talked to, uh, mentioned this before in the previous talks as well, is about bacterial resistance. And uh, this is one of the key things really about why you're trying to achieve this high concentration drug. The way this is basically tested is using a, a drug susceptibility population analysis, and this is using a tissue concentration simulation model. So you use a simulation model where you have bacteria basically plated on the concentration. You'll see the variation in the levofloxacin concentration over an eight-hour eight time period. And as the concentration basically fluctuates, this is trying to simulate actually putting a drop of antibiotic into the basically ocular surface itself. Then after 24 hours, you then take the bugs and then basically you will culture them in different media and basically different concentration of levofloxacin. And in this example over here, it's varying from zero, which is basically obviously your, your control group up to basically 8%. Now, if your bacteria are basically developing resistance, then you would expect you get growth at higher levels of basic levofloxacin concentration in this basically plated media. So what did the results basically show from this study over here? So if you look at the results over here in 1.5%, this is basically in the maroon bar, and this is compared to 0.5%, which is over here in the pink bar over here itself. This is the negative control on the left-hand side over here where there's no levofloxacin over here itself. So of course you do expect to see bacterial counts in this level over here, but you can see even at one times MIC all the way to 16 times MIC, there was little detection of live bacteria counting. And this shows you on the left-hand side over here, and also on the right-hand side over here is measuring the MIC concentration again, from basically uh, one to basically 16, where you can see minimal detection of basically any bacteria itself. So what it's showing you is, is that it's, it's actually, put, it, the, the bugs are not developing any resistance pattern when you're using this drug at this level of concentration. If you look at this basically compared to um, uh, methicillin organisms, so that was basically gram negative, now looking at basically gram positive organisms, again, with the same experimental setup, you're looking at basically the control group before exposure in gray bars, the pink one over here is 0.5% levofloxacin, and the maroon bar is over here is, is the 1.5% levofloxacin. Again, you'll see no generational resistance um, with respect to the 1.5% levofloxacin uh, group at all. And this is in a conjunctival concentration simulation model, and this is in a corneal uh, concentration simulation model on the right-hand side. When you look at Pseudomonas, which is obviously a common cause of uh, bacterial keratitis, especially in the Asia Pacific region, so it's an important uh, thing to basically for us to basically look at. Again, you will see that levofloxacin 1.5% solution is down over here, so there's no evidence of any basic development of resistance to the 1.5% uh, levofloxacin solution, but there is some element of developing resistance if you're using the 0.5% basically version over here itself, and you can see the concentration of resistance goes up to almost eight times the MIC concentration compared to basically baseline. So this proves that the thinking about the PGPD is not only seen by what we're able to measure in the concentration where you are achieving the higher levels of CMAX, but also what we're seeing basically in a practical side when you're actually trying to see if there's any resistance profiling on the organisms. So I'm just going to share with you um, our experience of basically using levofloxacin on a couple of our patients um, that we've been seeing uh, recently. Um, this is a 17-year-old uh, Malay girl. I'm going to show you some examples of some of the uh, uses of this antibody, especially when you're using multiple, uh, against multiple organisms. So she initially seen in one of our satellite hospitals with a four day history of uh, redness. Um, notice on the cornea, you can see the scarring and basically this infiltrate over here. Visual acuity was 660. She had a, the central intralate um, scraped. Um, this she was thought to be an atypical organism as well. And she had occasional cells um, in, in the anterior chamber. Um, she had a 0.3 uh, millimeter hypopian, and she referred um, to SNEC from our satellite, and she started on fortified um, kef and uh, gentamicin. She developed some toxicity to the gentamicin, as you can see in the middle picture over here, and she was put on, on uh, levofloxacin, 1.5%. Um, and uh, she's a contact lens wearer, so we asked her to bring her contact lenses so we can culture her case as well. 
And um, by looking at the appearance over here, it looked a little bit unusual with respect to the way the epithelium had grown. So we suggest we felt that it's probably a multiple or, multiple organism um, uh, growth. We know this from the ASIC study, considering about almost 60% of the uh, bugs that we basically cultured um, in, in the Singapore part were actually basically a multiple organism as well. And the idea was to basically review her again. Uh, we reviewed it in two days' time and painted basically settled down, visual acuity basically approved, hypopium was basically better, as you can see from the bottom pictures. Now, interestingly, when we basically took the results of the scrape, you'll see here she actually had three organisms on, on one culture plate over here, so Pseudomonas, uh, Serratia, and uh, Stenophos uh, nomus. And you can see basically the sensitivity patterns the, uh, to, to basically the three bugs on this side over here. And then when we've got one of the other culture plates back itself, you will see that she also had Pseudomonas and a Chromobacter. We see a Chromobacter relatively, I wouldn't say very commonly, but I see definitely probably about almost a dozen cases a year. And typically sometimes these are actually quite resistant um, to levofoxacin, and they often have to use a different drug, maybe it's even piperacillin, to basically kill the chromobacter. But typically we see it in a bit more immunocompromised eyes as well. So we added a bit of anti-inflammatory medication to the surface um, after about four to five days. Visual acuity basically improved to 612, and this is the last time basically where we we saw her saw her more recently. She's now up to 67.5. This is that one week review where she's 6.9. Six, six, and we basically managed to treat her empirically now on this antibiotic, even though she had these multiple basically um, organisms uh, grown from basically her um, ocular, uh, from her corneal and, and keratitis. So this shows the benefits of having a broad spectrum of antibiotic that's basically fortified, well, well, pseudofortified in the fact that it's commercially available, but it's giving you a high level of concentration activity um, when you're basically using it on the ocular surface with minimal toxicity compared to other fortified uh, medication. This is a second case I'm going to share with you, which is a 58-year-old Malay gentleman. It's a one-week history of basically redness. He's, again, a contact lens user. We had a lot of patients when we were in, uh, in um, lockdown here um, who came back in with contact lens basically related infection. So you can see here the 5.5 millimeter uh, uh, lesion in visual acuity was count fingers. Um, he had an epithelial defect over this area and had an interface with a small hypopian on the surface. There was some differential diagnosis as possibly a secondary bacterial infection on a, on a background of herpes. He was started on a sine career, um, topically and oral, and also 1.5% um, uh, um, uh, um, levofloxacin to be used basically day and night. Now you can see basically from his microscopy, in fact, he had gram positive cocci, gram negative bacilli, and gram positive uh, bacilli as well from the microscopy result from his um, microscopy and culture. Now, interestingly, we actually didn't grow anything from his uh, culture plates basically at all. So we're now treating him empirically. And often, obviously, we need to do this because just because you grow something from microscopy doesn't mean that you're going to be able to uh, culture anything. But two days later, his pain basically got better. His, uh, his epithelium basically started to heal over. We added in um, some anti-inflammatory medication as his epithelial defect was basically healing. And this is basically how he remained. We never really grew any basically cultures on the ocular surface. He's basically about 636 now, 624 on this side over here. We've trialed him with a contact lens and basically once the scarring has basically settled down, uh, we will put him for an anterior lamellar um, keratoplasty if he's unable to get any better visual acuity um, with respect to um, if he's really using a rigid gas permacontrol lens. But this shows you the advantage of having to treat somebody where you, even though you get something on microscopy, but you are unable to basically get it on the culture, which is, some, which is something that we all face, especially in larger hospitals, that we have to basically go with our response on the organism, uh, the response on the eye, as opposed to what we can basically get from our cultural results. The last case is a quite an interesting gentleman who's a man with a uh, 48 year old gentleman with, uh, with G6PD. Now, most of you will know that G6PD is actually a contraindication to using uh, levofloxacin, but there are variants with respect to the enzyme activity of G6PD. And typically the enzyme variant that we see in Asia is a little bit more, uh, you, you have a higher chance of basically, uh, of, sorry, you have a lower chance of actually getting a, a anemic um, side effects from using um, uh, fluoroquinolones, because especially if you're using basically topically compared to the Mediterranean version of G6PD deficiency. So he had a history of bilateral uh, LASIK, and, and there was some question about a history of him. Have, you saw a colleague of mine about a history of a viral conjunctivitis, and he came back in with a two-day history of a lid, lid lesion and punctate um, uh, lesion on his, um, on his uh, flap. He was seen again in one of our satellite hospitals. His video acuity at that time was 6'6", and he was given top breaks and loads max. He typically was given top breaks because basically they were worried about him using G6, uh, G6PD. The drops were basically stopped because he basically ran out of medication. And two weeks later, he returned back to our main center with a reduction in visual acuity, 
and he, you can see the lesions basically on the surface of the eye. But typically, these punctate lesions are on the surface. At that time, the clinician that saw him felt he could, this could be possibly herpes uh, related. He was given a cyclovir. He had a reaction to cyclovir, so he switched to Vergan. He was given a load of anti um, inflammatory, and everything basically seemed to clear up with that. A visual acuity proof was 66, and he basically was left alone. He then reappeared uh, six months later. So this was down during the circuit breaker period. So this is when I basically saw him and he had a history of four days of basically pain. Um, he had injection in the left eye, as you can see from the picture over here. And he had a redevelopment of these small little lesions basically on the surface. And he had follicles um, on his anterior chamber. And he had these basically small opacities that you can see clinically on his LASIK back. And interesting, he has a history of keeping uh, tropical uh, fish. Uh, he was unkeen for these to basically uh, be scraped off the center for microscopy. Um, but with that history of uh, fish um, as well, I, clinically, this to me looked like basically microsporidia. So we started in 1.5% um, uh, travit, uh, levofloxacin, to basically use every uh, three hours. So one week later, his really acuity was a little bit worse. So sometimes what happens is that when you start them on um, um, uh, levofloxacin, um, they get an increase in the amount of inflammation. Um, and so we added in some topical um, ointment to basically use at nighttime as well. He then basically came back again. Uh, his inflammation was basically less. I gave him a little bit of anti-inflammatory. I typically use betanazole at that time period, but you must basically keep them on the uh, levofloxacin as well at the same time. It's important that you use the fluoroquinolone because if you give them fluoroquinolone as well, it will clear, it will clear the trufozoids as they basically come out of the cyst and the, and the betanazole will reduce the inflammation in the anterior chamber. And two weeks later, he's now, his lesions are completely cleared up. His visual acuity is okay. Even though he's G6PD, there's been no change in his blood system whatsoever um, on this topical therapy. So he carried on for another few weeks and then basically we stopped this uh, medication for him completely. So in conclusion, uh, fluoroquinolones, as I basically showed you, work by DNA gyrase and toposomerase uh, 4 inhibition. Uh, Levofloxacin, 1.5% or Oftoquix, has demonstrated excellent safety efficacy uh, with respect to better corneal and aqueous penetration compared to other available um, uh, fluoroquinolones and better cell viability and migration compared to Vigamox. Levofloxacin 1.5% was developed on the theory of PKPD. So if you can get a high Cmax in the tissue, you're able to basically have a dramatic effect on inhibition resistance. And I showed you this from a theoretical standpoint. I showed you this from an experimental standpoint in animals and also basically in a clinical standpoint in patients as well. The high Cmax has been shown in rabbit studies in the conjunctiva, cornea, and also in the aqueous humor as well. So it's not just limited to one tissue. It has a broad spectrum of activity. It's fast acting with minimal toxicity. And it also basically shows the suppression to basically development of resistance. Uh, thank you for your attention.